Good morning, everybody, for the 10th and final lecture in this series. And today I'll be talking about questions of governing just transitions in mobility with a focus again on urban mobility. And in the very first lecture, this was one of the diagrams that I've shown you, and it shows the growth in CO2 emissions from transport at the global scale, phenomenal growth, and most of that growth is in passenger road vehicles, road freight, as well as aviation and, uh, and shipping. And uh, I guess this is one of the reasons, the key reasons why we need transformations in mobility, and particularly in urban mobility, as it is responsible for the bulk of emissions. In that first lecture, I also argued that climate change needs to be understood in broader terms than just CO2 emissions. The problem is broader and business as usual is not going to be feasible anymore. And I've drawn on the work of Belgian philosopher Isabel Stengers, among others, to argue that we are in a new era in which the planet's ecological and atmospheric systems are fundamentally changed in a way that precludes thinking in terms of, in the words of Stengers, bad moments that will pass or problems solved after which we can go back to exploit and think about the earth or nature in the ways the Western world has been doing since effectively the Renaissance. Even that, though, is only part of the story, as over the course of the lecture series, I've talked also about the huge inequalities in mobility and both the benefits and burdens it is uh, triggering. And perhaps that discussion was best illustrated by yesterday's reflections on, uh, on private jet use during the pandemic, where I tried to make clear how hugely unequal the, the, this form of elite mobility is and how much of a burden it is creating across uh, mobility systems as a whole. And that's why we need not simply a transition, but a just transition in mobility. And over the course of the lecture series, I've always concluded my talks with three takeaway messages. And nine lectures times three gives 27 of these takeaway messages. At first, I thought I'm going to display all of those on slides, but that's not going to work. So I've tried to condense it further into four main points. And those are the points that you see here. Because if we need, if we, if, yeah, if we need just transitions in mobility, then I think we need to do these four things. We need to, first of all, broaden our attention to a number of issues that we haven't been focusing on as much as I believe we should. And in lecture two, I talked about the importance of doing much more work around questions of adaptation, not simply look at climate change mitigation, but do much more work on adaptation. Yesterday I talked about the need for more work on long distance mobilities. And when we talked about platforms and platformization, I talked about the need to think about people who work in transport systems, not only focus on users as we tend to do, but just as much focus on the people working and, and driving the various, uh, various vehicles that people use. I've also spoken about the need to look not just at transport systems, but the systems they're entangled with. And again, yesterday we had the discussion about academic mobilities and how if we want to reduce emissions from academic flying, we need to think also about how, for instance, academic careers are framed and, and what, it needs, what, what you need to do as an academic. To, to become successful. And what holds for academia holds for many other sectors as well. And yesterday we also spoke about unintended consequences of various forms of intervention and the trickiness of trying to manage those. So a number of issues that we should do in addition to all the work, all the brilliant work that is already going on. We also need to rethink some of the concepts that we're working with. I think we need to do, we need to rethink our concept of justice. We need to actually think about what just transitions, just transformations entail. 
I've talked in one of the previous lectures about the, 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 the need to rethink how we understand the humans that make decisions, the human subjects that uh, are central to mobility systems. I've done a whole lecture on questions of capabilities and how we can focus and, and meaningfully study those. And I've also talked at the, uh, the, the start of the series a lot about value and practices of valuation that we can and I think should be changing. Let's focus a little bit more on, on the question of justice and just transformation because they're so central to uh, the, the, the whole course. So yesterday I showed this figure and uh, it, as I explained then it's essentially a reworked version of what I showed in the very first lecture and the point here is that transport has done, a, has seen a lot of work, a lot of really important and pertinent work on questions of distribution, the distribution of benefits and costs of transport systems. That work is needed and more of that needs to be done in a range of different contexts but we can't just limit our attention to questions of distribution because if we do that we, under we fail to understand the processes that are driving patterns of distribution so we need to bring in other forms of justice as well and I've argued that there is a whole raft of literature across the wider social sciences that we can draw on and in political science and feminist uh, uh, social science and geography in, in anthropology, range of different literatures we can work with. And in many ways, this concept of recognition is very central to this, which is about recognizing the different values, needs, understandings, customs of various groups, various communities, and taking that in on board in how we think about uh, questions of justice. And that then sort of is, that, that is still a very broad concept originally framed by, by Nancy Fraser and other feminist scholars. Um, there are different ways you can elaborate that. And I've suggested we need to think about questions of knowledge. So epistemic justice in this, which is about giving different communities the opportunity to make their voices heard, which is the testimonial justice and then also adapting knowledge generation processes with regards to transport and mobility to also adequately respond to the insights that various communities, various groups in various places can offer. And that's the hermeneutical justice. We will also need to think about historical patterns and historical depths, which is where the retrib retributive justice comes in a lot of the structural inequalities we see in mobility are related to historical development patterns which relate to the, the, the development of capitalism, the development of colonialism. We will need to come to terms with some of these issues which is going to be very tricky, very messy, but it is a discussion we start, we, we need to start uh, in, in the coming period and with yesterday I've talked about this a little bit in the context of aerial mobilities. I've also previously talked about this in relation to urban mobilities um, as well and there's just more work to be done in this area. All of that will also require a process of a focus on procedural justice which is the, the procedures through which decisions get made um, and plans get implemented where we need to think about who actually is driving these decision-making processes, what influence various participants have, who is able to participate on what grounds and so on and so forth. And it's the combination of these forms of justice that will, be, that will have to be central at questions of just transition. And I've argued that we need to do that for mobilities as well as for data, particularly with the rise of platforms, platformization. There's a huge set of 
additional literatures and additional ideas to be incorporated that relate to data justice. And that, this, that debate, that dialogue between mobilities and, and data and the transport and mobilities community on the one hand and uh, uh, social scientists uh, focusing on, on data and digital technologies needs to be had as well. These are different understandings of justice have also implications for how we understand this concept of just transformations. This is a slightly different version of the slide I showed in the opening lecture where I argued that there is no singular understanding of what a just transition or a just transformation entails. And that term means different things to different people. I explained that the origins of the term just transitions lie in the 1960s and 70s in the US with the labor movement where unions were demanding compensation for the closing down of economic activities for environmental reasons. And since then, the concept has evolved and has come to mean different things for different communities, which is why I propose to think of it in terms of a spectrum where, at least in the global north, that spectrum captures the degree to which the actions, interventions and consequences differ across the mobility systems that we have. And on the one hand of that spectrum, on, on the one end of that spectrum, we have what I call status quo understandings or straight status quo perspectives on just transition where basically the minimal is being done there is some attention being paid to questions of distribution but the emphasis is really on technological substitution and leaving the underlying systems including the way capitalism is structured basically intact so what you do under this configuration is to make sure that the worst off in society get some incentives to, for instance, participate and reap the benefits of electric mobility. But otherwise, the emphasis is really strongly on technological substitution to deal with the issues of CO2 emissions. On the other hand, other ends of the spectrum, we have what I call transformation, which is quite radical. It is about destabilizing automobility as we know it by making trans uh, active travel and collective transport the default forms of moving around. It reworks the capitalist system and it considers all the definite, all the elements of justice, all the dimensions of justice I've just discussed. And here I would add to that sort of spectrum on the basis of the things we've covered in the lecture series that in, under status quo the emphasis remains purely on the CO2 emission reduction and there's very little additional understanding or focus on climate change. And we stay within very conventional ways of knowing and valuing, valuing changes in systems. Whereas on the other hand, with the transformation end of the spectrum, we really see adaptation and, my, and, and mitigation being integrated into effectively one set of actions where all of this is driven by quite significant changes in how we know mobility systems and how we value them. So that's a series of things that we need to work on further. This is really start, really the beginning of what needs to be done. There's much more additional conceptualization to be done. In addition to reworking our concepts, we also need to think about how we go about in terms of our methodological practices. And over the course of this series, I've reflected on how we abstract and the processes of abstraction we habitually engage in. I've talked about how we understand causality and how that can be changed. And again, talked about valuation. And most of that material sits in lectures three and four and can be, uh, can be looked back online. Finally, I think the key point I would want to 
get across is that we need to further pluralize the knowledges with regards to transport and mobilities. And in, in uh, lecture three, I talked about how we've seen a pluralization where the, the conventional wisdom, you could say, from, uh, from economics and engineering has become complemented with insights from a range of other disciplines where it's not about one discipline being better than another. We need all of them, but I also argued that we need to push that further. So we need to bring in additional bodies of scholarship and we need to create a more level playing field for various types of understanding of transport. And that means, amongst others, that where the tendency we see in some quarters of transport scholarship that good research needs to be quantitative and needs to be sort of uh, based on, on, on ideas from, uh, from utility theory, it needs to be complemented with other ways of understanding transport. And as part of that, we also need to reflect on the kinds of assumptions we make about the extent to which we can know things. And yesterday I've made this argument about greater epistemic humility that I think we need. I've also talked over the course of the lecture series about governing in a, in, in a range of different ways. And this slide really tries to, to gather and summarize some of those insights. And I will then sort of build on this in the remainder of the lecture. To, to reflect more on this question of, of governance. I've tried to make this point that we really need to, what I would call, cultivate the new as well as break down old systems. I think there is often very much an emphasis on thinking about new ways of doing things, new technologies, for instance, without also thinking about the things that exist and that in some ways will need to be actively destabilized. And, it's very understandable that the two don't get equal attention because certainly politically destabilizing and breaking, uh, breaking down the old is, is something that is very tricky. It's, yeah, if you want to do, uh, if you want to do poorly in, in local elections in the UK, you will have to take away all parking for vehicles in residential neighborhoods, for instance. That's a, a recipe for disaster, uh, unfortunately, if, if, if for a politician. But we do need to think more about getting away with things we don't want anymore. I've talked about the importance of inclusivity and participation in all aspects of governing, right from the creation of vis visions to the monitoring and evaluation. I've talked about the need for experimentation and packaging, and I'll talk much more about that in a second. And I've talked about the need for reflexivity, accountability and humility in how we value, how we monitor, how we evaluate things. And I've shown this graph before, developed by uh, people in, in in Rotterdam, led by Derek Lohrbach, transition scholar, who sort of makes this really nice, which, um, which I think really nicely captures the need to both cultivate the new from bottom left to top right, but also break down the old and actively face it out. And uh, the need for sort of doing that in a way that, that puts questions of justice center stage. Moving forwards then, I want to talk about three action-oriented approaches to questions of governing. And uh, they're shown here as evolutionary policy mixes, transition management, and the work of grassroots or city makers. Um, and they can be distinguished from one another in a variety of ways, but one way of doing them, doing that is by looking at how they understand the role of the state and the level of participation within them. And the reason I've selected these three is that they complement each other in various ways. We've been working with them. There's interesting work going on. I think these are really, really interesting bodies of work that sit across different uh, forms of social science, including 
work on transport, but it, it, you, a lot of this is coming actually from innovation studies. And together they make a case for both top-down governing and bottom-up, because I think too often in, 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 in the thinking on governance, we have this debate as to what is better. Do we need to do things top down? Do we need to do them bottom up? I think we're now at a stage that we don't really have the luxury to choose anymore and we'll need to combine them in ways. Uh, that's easier said and done, but I think we, that is what this representation is trying to get at because evolutionary policy mixes is much more on the top down side of things. The grassroots obviously on the bottom up. You can add a third axis to the diagram as uh, if, if you like, which would be around justice and would go from a very simple conception of justice, very one dimensional, very singular to the, 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 the multi-dimensional, quite complex notion that I ended up with. And then you would, you would basically see that in the three dimensional space, the grassroots uh, uh, approach would sit sort of furthest along that justice axis because it has the most comprehensive understanding of justice embedded within it. But let's concentrate for now on these first two axes and, and sort of develop that a little bit further. So what we see here is that the evolutionary policy mixing approach, which was developed in innovation and transition studies, is about disrupting technological, institutional and behavioural lock-in. And this approach is particularly useful in domains or countries where government policy has a very strong influence on the nature of the transport system. The example I would... Uh, actually, the, the examples that have been published on, on, uh, on, on this work all hail from Scandinavia and that's not coincidental because I think you will see that the state has a relatively strong influence on how transport systems are configured there. And this approach has the government or the state really in the driving seats and there is space, there is actually some level of participation but it is typically downstream so it's when plans have been developed and effectively people get options where they can choose which one they like most. So the actual work and the thinking about the directions of travel have, has already been set, which is why we call it downstream. Transition management is an approach that works across different time horizons and actively seeks to overhaul existing systems. State-related organizations often play a significant role in this, but there is widespread and upstream participation of a wide range of actors within that. And I'll talk more about this with an example from Rotterdam in, uh, later on in the talk. Finally, the grassroots of city maker approaches are significantly more participatory and are usually characterized by a fairly restricted role of the state, which revolves around offering financial support and responding to grassroots demands. City makers actually sometimes actively go against the state, though certainly not always. And as the name entails, we see these approaches, especially in cities. I quite like this label of city maker because it kind of really gets at some of the, 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 the constitutive work, the creativity of what these uh, approaches are about. So I want to talk about these three approaches in turn, sorry. Evolutionary policy mixing entails the modification of existing and putting in place of new policies in order to institutionalize and stabilize the new and to dismantle the old. The word evolutionary is quite important here for it suggests a focus on dynamics and temporal patterns. So it leads thinking away from a narrow and opportunistic focus on the short term. The word evolutionary also suggests an emphasis on sequences of relatively incremental steps. It leads thinking away from the idea of revolu revolutionary or big bang types of change. And evolutionary 
policy making really revolves around playing with the rationality and the mechanism that exists that underpins each policy. So a rationality for a policy is the set of arguments about the problem that is being addressed and it's about what the policy seeks to achieve which is summarized in, in its goal. And uh, you can see that here sort of you've got these two uh, goals of maintaining versus disrupting. A mechanism is the way that goal is being addressed and it's epitomized in the instrument or the set of instruments that is being employed. If we think about policies as either consolidating the status quo or as accelerating transitions, then we can see that four types of policy mixing emerge and those are sort of shown in the, in the cells of the table. We've got layering where new policies complement existing instruments and goals and thus reinforce situations of lock-in. We've got conversions where new instruments displace old ones but goals remain intact and lock-in is also reinforced. We've got drifting, where instruments are kept, but goals change and path creation or creative destruction becomes possible. We've got finally replacement, where old instruments and goals disappear and new ones are put in place with a view of supporting a transition. It's evident that Encouragement of a transition or a transformation requires, first of all, careful sequencing of mixing strategies. You may want to begin with replacement and to a lesser extent drifting in the early phases when niches need to be institutionalized later on. You want to shift towards layering and conversion. You also need different types of instruments at different stages. Command and control instruments are particularly helpful to dismantle the old, whilst economic and soft interventions can help niches to emerge and to mature. And later on, when you want to rapidly scale up things, things like uh, uh, you, you can encourage the new by the standardization that command and control measures allow you to bring and by embedding things into the built environment and in planning and design measures. That's the theory that you do it is quite deliberately in a nice sensible manner. It's not how it usually works in practice of course because in practice it is often quite chaotic and opportunistic, not least because of political pressures, electoral changes, and so on and forward. So policy evolution occurs incrementally, incrementally and chaotically through various cycles in most uh, situations. And the paper by Kotilain and et al. looks at how this has been done for uh, EV policies, so electric vehicle policies in, in Scandinavia. And I think that is really a useful approach, but the original work doesn't really talk about just transitions, just change in this. And I think a number of recommendations can be offered that partially follow the work that has been done before, but also push that a little bit forward. And I think the first point I would make is that, uh, the, let's reiterate the point that path creation is not sufficient. You will need to dismantle the old as well. And that's why when we're talking about electrification of vehicles in the European context, it is so important that more and more countries are putting in place bans on the sale of new fossil fuel powered vehicles or are tightening up and the timelines for these. So the UK has now moved from 2040 to 2035 and now 20, 2030. And that is sort of having genuine effects in terms of the acceleration of the transition trajectory. 
I would also say that it's important to be reflexive. What is it that you want to achieve in the short term and what do you want to achieve in, in the long term? Concentrate on the long term goals and choose your shorter term objectives and, and instruments accordingly. And in doing so, build question, aspects of justice into both your long term goals and your short term objectives. And at a minimum, that would need to be about distribution. But if we want to push environment, uh, sort of evolutionary policy mixing beyond what I've called status quo approaches to just trans transition, then procedural and, and recognition justice will need to be incorporated too. It's also important to use all instrument types available, including the more politically challenging ones. Think of it in terms of carrots and sticks and enhance the acceptability by packaging politically difficult interventions like an early ban on petrol and diesel vehicles with support for manufacturers, better public transport, the rollout of a public charging infrastructure, a vehicle scrappage schemes, especially for low income households and so on and so forth. And finally, focus on the dynamics. So tweak the mix of policies over time. And for electrification, that may well be starting with the rollout of a charging infrastructure in the hope that this will instill some confidence in prospective consumers and set up a vehicle scrappage scheme a little bit later on when it is important to get all the more polluting vehicles driven by less privileged owners of the roads. And in terms of charging infrastructure, I would say it makes, if that needs to be operated on a for-profit basis, then it is understandable that governments and operators start with a focus on uh, locations where early adopters are likely to live or visit and shift slightly later the attention to areas where marginalized communities are concentrated. So this evolutionary policy mixing approach is useful and appealing in many ways, but it does leave public authorities firmly in the driving seat, as I've explained, even if it can be made participatory in a number of ways. A different approach is transition management developed in the Netherlands in the, 19, in the 1990s. It is an explicitly normative approach that focuses on the long term, typically something like 25 to 30 years, as a framework for shorter term objectives and interventions. It tries to work with the grain of ongoing developments and makes changes to shorter term objectives and interventions when opportunities present themselves. Upstream participation is key, as I've already explained, and it occurs at all stages and in various forms of the process. Experimentation is essential. And the idea of letting a thousand flowers bloom is quite relevant here because one never fully knows in advance what outcomes an experiment will yield, will yield and whether those will be useful or appropriate at the time that they emerge. Time will tell ultimately what lines of experimentation should be taken forward, institutionalized and stabilized. That's the idea. And finally, it is very much about collective learning. Ongoing cycles of monitoring and evaluation, sharing lessons and knowledge, reflecting, adapting objectives, plans and actions accordingly. And given the emphasis on up upstream participation, the approach is in principle compatible with a pluralist conception of justice along the lines that I've been developing. So procedural justice is clearly there, as is at least in, in theory, an emphasis on distribution, on recognition, and on epistemic justice. Now, whether this actually happens in practice is another matter. I would say that not that much attention has been given to these various dimensions of justice in practical uh, applications. Though the case study I will show in a minute in Rotterdam begins to, uh, begins to change this.
Transition management has become best known through the heuristic of the transition management cycle that is shown here on the slide, where transition management is assumed to start with activities at what is known as the strategic level. This is where the long-term aims are developed and the transition arena is being created. Now, that transition arena is effectively the nerve center where front runners from government, business, academia, and the voluntary sector come together. They develop a vision and they translate that into a broad transition agenda. This is the site then where procedural justice begins to come into play. Although recognition and distributive justice can be made key elements of that goal and vision. And indeed, that's what been happening in, in the Rotterdam case study that I'll talk about in a minute. Now, strategic activities must be complemented by activities at the tactical level. The focus here is on the subsystem. So if the system is urban mobility, then the subsystem would be something like cycling or car sharing rather than the whole system. It is also at the tactical level that overarching goals and the transition agenda are translated into something that works for the subsystem. Important here is the development of what you could call coalitions of the willing. Actors who are willing to derive agendas for their subsystem and drum up the resources for experimentation at the operational level. And procedural recognition and distributive justice can come together as well at this level. The same is true for the operational level, which is where short-term actions and decisions are made. This is where actual experiments get designed, undertaken, adapted and integrated with one another. Finally, at the reflexive level, the collective learning is supposed to take place. And it consists of monitoring and evaluation activities, the sharing of emerging uh, insights, debates, adaptation of activities at the strategic, tactical and operational level. So this is where epistemic justice would, come, would need to come into play as well. That's the theory. Now let's look at an example. And this is a paper that uh, we published late last year in, in the new journal that, uh, that Frank is also editing, uh, Journal of Urban Mobilities, and, and sort of one of the new journals in the Elsevier family. The paper really has been written and conceived by Derek Lohrbach. All the credits should go to him. And it really captures some of the experience, some of the uh, the reflections and experience he gained from leading a transition management process in urban mobility in the Rotterdam context. So the process summarized in the paper started in 2015 when calls for more sustainable, more efficient, more equitable transport in Rotterdam became louder. Rotterdam, as you may know, is a post-industrial city that was bombed in the Second World War. And as a result of that, has seen a very car-oriented redevelopment process in the 1950s and 60s. The city has an ethnically diverse population and is characterized by major socioeconomic, health and transport-related inequalities. And concerns over these inequalities, the extensive road congestion and climate change help to create widespread appetite for structural change. And this was solidified by local elections in 2018, after which a local government came to power that sought to achieve a just sustainability transitions, transition in mobility and other domains. This then led to the creation of a team of civic servants and a chair from academia who developed a, sit a vision and selected 150 participants from the private, public and third sectors in the city. They developed a transition arena and a transition agenda in which digital technology enabled car sharing played a pivotal role as an innovation onto which 
other behavioral institution and technological changes could be tacked. The transition arena developed four principles, affordability, availability, accessibility, and acceptance that formed, informed the specification of a broad package of interventions. And these can be grouped into three categories. There is the building up of an emerging alternative through measures like electric car, the promotion of electric car sharing, the creation of car-free zones, support for cycling and walking. The second category is about transforming existing institutions in the cities. So changing air quality regulations, changing parking restrictions, tightening parking restrictions, really, and making changes to local taxation and land use planning. And the third category is about phasing out undesirable elements, such as subsidized parking and high speeds for vehicles in, in the city. The interventions were ultimately bundled into 12 what were locally known as climate deals that became official policy and was, was then, uh, were then implemented. And actually that implementation and their realization was accelerated by the COVID pandemic, which in Rotterdam, as in many other cities, made some of the deep inequalities that were always existing much more visible and many more people uh, aware of those, in, uh, of, of those inequalities. Plus, the restrictions on car use has ha led to notable improvements in air quality and sort of made streets much more sort of public spaces where people were dwelling rather than simply conduits for, for circulating vehicles. So the whole process led to a culture change in the city. A new discourse around mobility became dominant. This was one that privileged justice and sustainability. And it highlights the importance of experimentation and delegitimizes individual car ownership and use. This is also where the car sharing comes in. It challenges the taken for granted assumption of private ownership and draws attention to thinking in multimodal terms because we know that shared cars are hardly ever sufficient to meet all of one's mobility needs. And because shared cars take up less space for parking, car sharing offers opportunities for thinking in creative ways about streets as places for urban life rather than as spaces for traffic flow or the storage of vehicles that sit idle for most of the time. The whole process has led to an expansion of different forms of car sharing in Rotterdam and shared mobility has become more affordable, wider available and better accessible. But the transition has also been significantly contested. There's considerable resistance from many inhabitants in the city and also from politicians, local politicians that you could say sit more on the right hand side of the political spectrum. And this is why Derek writes in the paper, and I'm quoting him literally here, the future of the mobility transition is also still open. The destabilization of individual car-based mobility regime regime is evident, as is the emergence of just and sustainable alternatives. But the future pathway will depend on the collective transformative governance capacities of the community, policy and business. I would say on reflection that justice does feature significantly and prominently in this process, but the emphasis is mostly on distributive and procedural justice. I would say the whole debate in Rotterdam has been rather thin in terms of recognition justice because that is in part because disadvantaged has been considered in fairly generic ways. There's talk about income differences, differences between ethnic groups, differences according to age. There's a difference being made in terms of car use. But it remains kind of at that level. It's all for very, very generic, quite abstract groups still. And I would say that is not unusual for policy 
processes. I think we, in, in the UK we see very similar things. Work in Bristol that we're currently undertaking is suggesting something similar. Discussions at local level are sort of phrased in these very, very generic terms. And, and work that's been undertaken in, in London by Emilia Smets and colleagues on uh, nighttime mobility suggests something very similar too. So quite useful and very powerful but also an approach that requires significant monitoring and evaluation capabilities. And some people would say transition management remains too strongly focused on the creation of consensus. And by the creation of that consensus precludes forms of more radical dissent. Genuine dissent, more radical approaches are being marginalized is the argument that some would make. And, and Eric Swingedow, I've mentioned him before, as the, the, the Belgian geographer sort of would, would probably agree that tr uh, transition management can quickly become a, a post-political approach. It doesn't have to, and it didn't do in the Rotterdam case, but there are other examples where it has become somewhat, somewhat post-political. So, this is also where this third set of grassroots or city maker approaches comes in. They are often, though not always, more radical, inclusive and focused on justice, understood in terms of distribution, participation and recognition. I don't want to talk too much about them, so let me sort of highlight a couple of points. One is that this approach covers a very wide range of, uh, of initiatives uh, undertaken by a series of different actors. And uh, we did some work on this in the context of cycling and walking in London and Sao Paulo. And uh, together with Denver uh, Nixon, we, we, we spent an awful lot of time trying to make sense as to the, the how heterogeneous this range of activities is. And, and these four pictures just capture some of that diversity. The, the, the left two are from Sao Paulo, the other two are from, um, from London. And uh, one of the interesting things in, in Sao Paulo was that there was quite a strong emphasis on the built environment, on things around design. So there was one really interesting initiative or, or a program to redesign these kind of urban, uh, uh, sorry, the, the, these, 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 these corridors, these, these staircases. Sao Paulo is a very hilly city um, where, where you now see sort of these transparent uh, handrails. They used to be concrete walls. So you can imagine that creates secluded spaces. This was an ideal place for drug trafficking because it was also very accessible. It was very central in the neighborhood. It set that sort of the connections between the neighborhoods. So perfectly rational for a drug dealer to locate here. And they could very easily hide their activities. So in terms of walking, this created enormous issues for the local population. So this organization or a series of organizations were literally opening up these spaces and then brought in local artists to do the graffiti to give it uh, sort of this, this, more, uh, um, this more inviting look. There were also all kinds of activities focused on uh, redesigning streets. So illegally painting zebra crossings and uh, uh, cycleways in places where the local government was seen as uh, um, not living up to its promises and, and not providing what it, what it ought to provide. And um, sometimes that led to a little bit of a cat and mouse game where the activists would paint things often overnight, and this one is not overnight, of course, but many of these activities were done overnight. Then the right-wing press would, would make a scandal of them. Government would see itself almost forced to take them away, so paint them over again. And then the activists would go in again, so you get this cat and mouth game 
um, until at some point the local authority would give up and actually was secretly quite happy for this to happen because they don't really have the resources and, and, and the manpower, the person power the, uh, to, to, to do this. In London we saw much less of this and it was much more around things uh, that have to do with various kinds of training. Um, so cycle, cyclability, cyclability training on the top right and uh, various forms of bike mechanics. Bike mechanics is an integral part of cycle activism all around the world and uh, one, of the, one of the most fascinating initiatives we spoke to was a, a organization that organized bike mechanic workshops and training for women and gender variant people who would potentially feel uneasy going into a conventional cycle workshop where particular styles of masculinity would be would be prevailing. Now, this really is only the tip of the iceberg. We try to come up with various classifications of the diversity of these initiatives. Um, this is what we saw in, in Sao Paulo. They respond to various needs and forms of disadvantage. They do both cycling and walking. They provide all kinds of infrastructure broadly understood and they come in a range of organizational forms. The the, the, I've got a similar diagram for London, it looks a little bit different. Perhaps the most important difference is that in, in London the emphasis is much more on cycling, much less on walking and I think that would be the same across, all, across other European cities. What these schemes do, and what these activities, these initiatives do, is extending walking and cycling capabilities in the city, especially for marginalized groups. And I've shown you this diagram before. What these initiatives do is they work at the level of resources, the level of the conversion process, the security and the robustness of the capability. And um, yeah, I can talk more about that if that is of interest. This diagram was created by a series of researchers uh, also in the Netherlands um, and, and I think also in, in Belgium where they've looked at grassroots or city maker initiatives across a range of different sectors um, and they, they identify a number of ways in which these initiatives uh, bring about change. Um, I find this diagram very helpful. Uh, it offers a slightly more conceptual approach to differentiation of grassroots and city maker initiatives and activities. I don't think all the activities are fully relevant for the uh, urban mobility realm, but I think what it really does nicely is make a distinction between firstly events and places, secondly the bright idea, and thirdly, the alternative system, and finally, the supportive network and platforms. So in terms of events and places, these are really important because these are the places where people from different backgrounds meet and come together. So in Sao Paulo cycling activism, it was the periodic bicycle maintenance and repair workshops that really fulfilled that function. Once a month, all activists came together to uh, liaise, to network, to build ca capacities, to exchange information and so on. The bright idea is developed by visionaries and it's turned into practical interventions. And there are many of these bright ideas, but uh, I've talked previously about schemes where differently abled people in London could learn to cycle and experience the joys that cycling brings. And I've shown you pictures of these, these adapted bikes and uh, talked about how enormously expensive they are. The alternative system is the loose network of initiatives in both London and Sao Paulo that support disadvantaged individuals in walking 
jogging and cycling together. And perhaps some of the most evocative ones we saw were in, in London, in North London, where people were organizing collective bike rides for young men, young disenfranchised men who had never been in certain neighboring areas because they were dominated by rival gangs who differed from the ones that were uh, dominating the area where they've lived. So this was really the first time they were able to venture into these, these parts, of the, parts of the city. In terms of supporting platforms and network makers in Sao Paulo, to a lesser extent in London, digital technologies were really important. Facebook, Twitter, other social media played a role. Um, but there is also a range of other platforms and, and networks that, that you can think of. So in, um, in, in many Latin American cities, you have, you have organizations where these particular initiatives come together and, and do things collectively. So uh, in, in Rio, for instance, there's the urban permanent, the, sorry, the permanent urban mobility forum that has been studied by my colleague, Ocilia Verlingeri, and uh, former PhD student Paula Castaneda has studied the World Bike Forum in Latin America, which also plays a very strong role, an important role in, in bringing together these kinds of initiatives. So what characterizes these city maker initiatives is not simply their differentiation, but also their flat organizations. They are genuinely participatory and deliberative, more so than the transition management approach. They prefigure feature, futures in which procedural justice sits at the heart of decision making, strategizing, planning and implementation. That doesn't mean they're entirely egalitarian, however. Just to give you one example, it's not uncommon for cycling-related city makers to marginalize feminine and LGBT plus perspectives. City makers' initiatives have huge potential in reimagining and practically reconfiguring urban transport, but they are also often held back by limited financial and staffing resources. They often depend quite heavily on grants from charities and, and local government. In the UK context, uh, lotteries play a very important role in subsidizing some of, these, some of these activities. And that reliance on a content, continual process of grant winning creates problems. It's a little bit like f the way things work for us in academia, that it's very difficult to sort of develop a long-term strategy if you constantly have to work from one grant application for a year or for two years to the next. It's very difficult to get long-term operational funding that will also fund your staff. People, organizations are very interested in, in, organize, in, in funding activities that will create impact, but they will less, be less interested in um, funding, funding salaries. There's a strong bias in the evaluation of different appraisal, of, of different uh, uh, proposals towards quantitative evidence, which is sometimes very hard to generate for these kinds of activities. And often you see that many of these funders privilege larger schemes and larger organizations because that is administratively efficient and it means that you can, uh, that, that you at least have the potential to create greater impact. I think these schemes are very important not only on what they do in and of themselves by enhancing walking and cycling capabilities, but also because of the extensive experimentation that is going on. They are really very experimental. There's a lot of failure, but there's a lot of very good ideas coming out of this too, which then get absorbed by other organizations, bigger organizations, including public policy. These initiatives also complement the local state at times of austerity. Of course, we need to be careful here because 
this kind of activity should never become an excuse for the local state for not doing certain things. But these organizations and the way they interact with particular groups in the city is something that they do that in, with a sensitivity and, and, a, and a tailoring that local state organizations can really not do to the same extent. So these organizations, these initiatives generate a series of positive externalities from which public policy more generally bit, uh, can, can benefit. And social cohesion and trust in community ownership are very important elements in this. Still, I would argue that on the basis of the research that we have done, this kind of activity is most impactful when they become linked up and can in that way cross fertilize one another. And that's why social media is so important, but also these events and the sites for hosting them are so important. So one thing that local public policy can do is create or provide spaces for these types of organizations and initiatives to, to do their thing. And uh, I think that's particularly important in, at least in Latin American cities, outside of the central parts of cities. In the central parts, you see quite strong networking and quite strong integration, often driven by young people, highly educated, quite ideologically driven, uh, very well uh, adapted using, using digital media. But if you look at the peripheries, it becomes much more fragmented, much more isolated. Um, and it's really sort of individuals who do things on a certain scale. And that's where I think a lot of the benefits uh, of, of further support by local states, organizations can, can play a very important role. So on the city or city regional scale, most grassroots initiatives tend not to make much of a dent individually, but collectively they open up different futures for urban mobility that are configured around justice, livability, and environmental sustainability. And these are realized either through the schemes these organizations put in place directly or indirectly via the shifts they bring about in how other actors in the public and private sector work towards transitions in mobility. However useful I think these three approaches of evolutionary policy mixing and transition management and, and to a lesser extent the grassroots approaches are, we should also uh, uh, focus on some of the, some of the critical, ref uh, some of the critical issues and some of the risks that, uh, that are associated with them. And one of them is that both evolutionary policy mixing and transition management are very Northwestern European in terms of their being. They, that's where they emerged. That's what they are tailored to and sort of institutional systems that are dominant in that kind of context. So they work, they, they kind of assume a liberal democratic system to be in place and they presuppose considerable legitimacy, capability, resourcing and expertise in local government. And that does not always exist in other places. And you can see that these kinds of approaches may not work quite in the same way in those kinds of contexts. There are also many barriers and I've already alluded to some of these when I talked, to in, uh, talked about the Rotterdam um, experience and, and the, the significant resistance that was in place. But there are others. There is inertia, there's path dependence, there is the inevitable short-termism, there is selfishness and, and prejudice too. And this question of popular resistance is really important. And I'll just give you one final example from my own experiment from my own experience we've seen in the UK quite a few low traffic neighborhood schemes being rolled out on the back of the pandemic and some of these sort of in an in an experimental mode well we do this for some time we'll evaluate and then we we'll decide whether we continue or whether we expand them and um, 
that has triggered significant resistance to the extent that in Oxford we have, uh, as in other places, we have local elections coming up and in East Oxford, the area where I happen to live, we got some of these uh, schemes and we see that uh, politicians who used to be of one of the established parties have now sort of turned into independent candidates to cam on, a, on a single issue politics of against these LTNs. And Oxford is not the only place to res this is going to be a really important topic in the upcoming um, local elections in, in early May. What direction it will go is, un is unclear whether these, these independent single issue politicians will, will make much of a dent remains to be seen. If they are at a natural disadvantage because they don't have the whole campaigning apparatus behind them. And there is research that suggests certainly in London that actually the silent majority quite likes these LTNs and have become adapted to them. Um, and it is the vocal, the most vocal people who sort of get most attention in, in the wider public debate. So we'll have to see. But it does show how contentious these kinds of initiatives are and, and how it slows down progress. And I don't want to really think that much about what will happen in Oxford if these LTN experiments are being terminated, because I think that will have quite significant long-term effects and will significantly reduce the appetite for other types of experimentation in, in uh, local transport policy. I think it will actually uh, uh, reinforce and inculcate a, a culture of risk aversion going forward. But the problems, of course, uh, don't go away in the same way. So, so it, will be very, it will be very difficult to see what the future will bring. We should also not forget that Egypt approach and every instantiation of it privileges particular discourses and particular knowledges. So they do reproduce and produce particular norms and subjectivities. And there is a risk of what in the justice literature is known as misrecognition, which is about there are various forms of misrecognition uh, ranging from, from non-recognition where certain groups are rendered invisible to outright disrespect where certain groups are being mis routinely maligned and disparaged using stereotypes and I would say in some of the grassroots uh, um, organizations certain individuals do sometimes show disrespect towards the role of the private sector and private sector operators and if but if sort of for, for just transitions in, in, in urban mobility they will have to be involved in all sorts of ways because of the technologies they provide, because of the importance of mobility management, which is known to be quite, a, quite an effective way of bringing about change in travel behavior, because of various forms of sponsoring that they can provide. So all these issues, we, we should not romanticize and we should always remain critical. I guess that's why we are in the luxurious position of being social scientists. And finally, we should not forget the importance of action at the supra and transnational scale, because there is an important role for actors at those levels. Uh, think of the UN organizations, EU uh, organizations like the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy, SLOCAT, and they do a number of things that are, provide context for what can happen at the urban scale. For instance, they can help to develop regulation. And I think that's particularly important when we're thinking about vehicle industry, when we're thinking about things like fuel standards. That is something that the EU has turned out to be incredibly uh, successful in. I would say probably from, from, a, from a CO2 point of view, the most important uh, um, 
policy intervention has been the tightening of fuel standards over a sort of uh, the, the last couple of decades. UN organizations are very important in providing discourse. The Sustainable Development Goals are a sort of one example of how this is important and how it provides a simple framework for thinking about change in transport. There's obviously questions of funding that's present, that, that's, uh, that's provided, particularly in Africa, Asia, Latin America. The development banks have been very important. And these transnational organizations are very important for capacity building. Think about networking, think about standardization, think about the exchange of information know-how and technology. And of course there are issues here because sometimes these organizations are heavily committed to top-down approaches and have a preference for big projects. Not quite silver bullets but very focused on a limited range of solutions. We've done some work looking at governance of, of uh, urban uh, transport planning in, in a series of large cities in, in East and Southeast Asia, and then you see sort of, yeah, BRT, uh, light rail. The idea often is big problems require big solutions. And, and I think that mentality goes against some of the things that I've been talking about today, about uh, diversity, range of different uh, um, initiatives, and also think about the small as beautiful. And I think that is really important too. I've come to the end of this final lecture, so no takeaway messages, simply three final thoughts. Because I would say there is no standard approach to how we can effectively govern just transformations in urban mobility. It's, have, it's going to be a mix of different approaches um, and I've highlighted three of those. There are others you can think of. They will also need to be adapted to local contexts. Um, and it is important that we think about how they can be made more uh, symbiotic and more complementary to, to, to one another. That doesn't mean there is no space for disagreement or discussion because of the very nature of climate change. We need discussion, we need disagreement that will ultimately help to sharpen our minds and, and push things forward. There is also a need for bringing, for further experimentation. That's kind of a, a refrain that's come up time and again over the lecture series. And I think it is important to bring on board more actors across the planet. I've already spoken about the role of the private sector and also organizations as employers so that um, we can sort of capitalize on what they can uh, bring to the table as well. I would say as a final thought that just transformation as a framing is quite helpful. It fosters a broad understanding of climate change in relation to mobility. It integrates or it helps to integrate climate mitigation with climate resilience, inclusivity and health. It opens up genuinely different futures. So it induces imagination, experimentation, coalition building, reflexivity as well as practical action and not least optimism and we need a lot of those all those qualities as well. Thank you very much. And as the final slide, I would really like to thank the Frankie Foundation. I would like to thank Gant Opportunity for giving me the opportunity to give this lecture series and to also develop my own thinking on some of these issues. I would want to thank my many collaborators because it's been me who's doing the talking, but through me, many different voices have been speaking and I've, I hope I have done justice to what they would want me to say. Of course, there are the funding agencies, UKRI in particular, who have funded many of the activities I have, uh, I have been able to undertake and to lead. And finally, I would really want to thank you
and Frank and his, and his team, Natalie, uh, Sophie, Bocht, and uh, thank you very much. And that's the end of the lecture. Questions?